Welcome to A Little Too Quiet, the Ferndale Library podcast. It's brought to you by the friends of the Ferndale Library, and my name is Jeff Milo. Today we're talking to New York Times bestselling author Riley Sager, author of seven novels, including Survive the Night, which came out last year. And in fact, Riley Sager was on this very podcast to talk about that most recent book. But Riley Sager already has his next book out. It's out June 20th. It's called The Only One Left, another twisty thriller. Although, you know, we talk about genre when we start this interview, and I think my own mind is influenced by the cover art of a lot of Riley Sager novels. If you were just to look at the cover, and again, we're judging books by covers, but if you were just to look at the cover, it almost looks like his books could be the posters of horror movies, like maybe late 80s horror movies, <laughs> classic horror movie vibes. And There are scary elements in his books, but when we talk more about it, we really come to the conclusion that at at his heart, he's he's a thriller writer, and he is really into constructing really great mystery, and we do have a great mystery on our hands here with The Only One Left, but we are getting into gothic territory, and maybe a little bit of gothic horror too. Or should I say gothic chiller about a young caregiver, it's set in the 80s, who is assigned to work for a woman accused of a Lizzie Borden-like massacre that happened decades earlier. Now, this is uh, Lenora Hope, who is now in her 70s at this point in the 80s. But way back when she was 17, she was accused of hanging her sister with a rope. And it's now become kind of lore. It's kind of like this urban myth, kind of a schoolyard chant, the Hope family murders, shocked the main coast one bloody night back in 1929. And while most people assume 17-year-old Lenora was responsible for the hanging, the police were never able to prove it. Other than her denial after the killing, she has never spoken publicly about that night, nor has she set foot outside of Hope's End, which is this cliffside mansion. Uh, so, you know, you get that trope of the, the gothic manor on a cliff, no less, where the massacre supposedly occurred. So now you cut to 1983 and you have young Kit McDear, who's working as a home health aide. And she arrives at this decaying mansion, Hope's End, to care for Lenora after her previous nurse fled in the middle of the night. Well, that's not suspicious, is it? In her 70s now, she's confined to a wheelchair and she's rendered mute by a series of strokes and she can only communicate with Kit by tapping out sentences on an old typewriter. And one night, Lenora uses it to make a tantalizing offer to her her young caregiver. She says, I want to tell you everything. And as Kit helps Lenora write about the events leading to the Hope family massacre like a real actual ghostwriter, it becomes clear there's more to the tale than people know. But when the new details about her predecessor's departure, the nurse that ran out in the middle of the night, when more details come to light about that nurse, Kit starts to suspect Lenora might not be telling the complete truth, and that the seemingly harmless woman in her care could be far more dangerous than she first thought. So this is a thriller, a chiller, a mystery, gothic horror. There's certain fun to be had with the tropes that are woven into that. But we start off talking about the balancing act of actually describing what it is like to be a caregiver, even if this is fiction and it's embellished and there's maybe a murder involved, etc. We we start off talking about genre and then we start talking about caregiving and character development. Anyway, thanks for tuning in. Here's our chat with Riley Saker. Hey, how are you? Good. How are you? I'm good, man. Thanks for the chance to chat with you. No problem. Sorry, I'm like I think I'm like a minute late, but yeah, sorry. How dare you? Uh, it's fine. I know the the nerve. <laughs> it's a busy day. It's a busy day. Happy happy book. It's almost book birthday, isn't it? It's almost out. Um, yeah, it's it's um, we're like six days away. June twentieth. Crazy. Yeah. Yes. A solstice book. All right. Yes. <laughs> Welcome officially welcoming in summer with my my crazy little thriller yes and let's talk about writing crazy little thrillers and let's also talk about the the balancing act balancing act there too um you know i I was uh, i'm gonna start off being fixated on genre 
I think that your your name tends to be associated with horror sometimes or something scary. But damn it, if this isn't a good mystery. You know what I mean? It's yeah, it's it's interesting like what I think of myself as a thriller writer. Yeah. Yet there are also elements of horror sure. in some of my books and elements of mystery and this one I really wanted to go full on gothic. Yeah. Cuz I think I think gothic is having a bit of a renaissance which is awesome because I love them and it wasn't intentional like oh I'm going to jump on this trend. <laughs> I think I'd been sort of like leaning toward gothic. Cuz I mean I think my book Home Before Dark is yeah. gothic. Yeah. And 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 so it it just seemed like a natural thing to do. It's like, yeah, let's just write a full on gothic novel. We've got the young woman going to this mansion. We've got a sinister housekeeper and a sexy groundskeeper and windswept cliffs and all of like these tropes and mm-hmm. oh, it might be haunted, maybe, we don't know. <laughs> and just all these it was so much fun, like just tossing in everything. Yes. And then at the center of it all placing this woman who can't talk, can't walk, can only use her left hand enough to use a typewriter Mm -hmm. who might've murdered her entire family when she was 17. And when I kind of came up with the recipe for this book, I just thought, Oh, this is going to be fun. This is, this is going to be a good one. Yeah. And uh, an emphasis on might have. Uh, and let, let's let's remember, I think history will show Lizzie Borden was never convicted. Um, so. Right. Yes. Yes. <laughs> and the other key thing about a gothic that I've learned over the years is that uh, there's usually a, a manor, a house, a mansion, a castle. And that in and of itself is kind of a character unto itself and is also maybe decrepit, too, or, or just overly spooky. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, talk about that balancing act of like there, there is something fun and you've already used the word fun and I wanted to use the word fun. It is fun to return to, to Gothic, but you are really digging into some really sincere substantive, like ideas around grief and caregiving and man, you really pulled it off. Can you talk about, can you talk about that and what, what was key to pulling that off and, and. And maybe a bit about developing Kit. Yeah, um, Kit has like like most of my protagonists, Kit has gone through some things. Sure. And I always find that fascinating because I love damaged characters because in some way we're all damaged. Like, you know, the, the pandemic messed us up so much in ways that we still are discovering. Like it threw everyone for loop. And so I wanted to put her in this situation that is so foreign to her, but also she can relate to because first and foremost, she is a caregiver. Mm -hmm. Like she stresses this, I care. And she does have to do everything for this woman who might be a murderess. And so she has to feed her. She has to bathe her. She has to do everything. And there's this great scene where Kit is, you know, holding Lenora's hand just to sort of like checking the reflexes and realizes, oh, she might have killed her family with this hand. And then she just drops it instinctively. And then she feels guilty about dropping it. And it's this whole mess of emotions that she's feeling where she needs to care for, she needs to keep this woman alive. Mm-hmm. Yet she's also a bit frightened of her. Mm-hmm. Yet she also kind of likes her. And she sees herself in Lenora in many, many ways. And some might be a little bit spoilerish, but like sure. she she looks at Lenora and she kind of sees a reflection of herself. Mm-hmm. And th- that to me was very fascinating to have this caregiver going through this gamut of emotions while at the same time navigating a mansion that is literally tilted. <laughs> And falling, you know, leaning toward the sea and that she's literally unbalanced, mm-hmm. like both literally and figuratively. And I thought that the the house was a great way to show her mental state. 
A hundred percent. And I don't, I don't know how many interviewers you're going to come across who are, who's going to say this, but over the last three years, I've become a caregiver. And so I oh, can, wow. I can say you got it. Like this Thank whole you. vibe of, uh, kind of just an indiscriminate care, uh, this all like this whole, like you are being called upon kind of thing or the empathy that comes into it. Um, whether you have, maybe it's your parents or not, whether you have baggage with the person or not, you just, it's literally just like holding a frail human body in your hands because you want to help them stay alive. And you caught that in kit perfectly. Oh, Just thank like, you so much. A hundred percent. Um, so there's that, but I, I'm not taking care of a potential murderer though. <laughs> that <laughs> I know of. Are, I think, yeah, that's true. Mm -hmm. But, um, yeah. So, uh, yeah. Talk about, and talk about just, um, developing the, the mystery. And, um, cause I, I almost wonder like, do, do you as an author, do you get kind of a cork board out? Do you have to keep these wires from getting crossed in your own head as you're developing it? Um, sometimes I do have to resort to, and if you, I'm in my office where I write right now. And if you could see like the floor over there, uh -huh. you would see several dozen index cards. I knew it. Arranged on the floor where I'm trying to figure out the plot of my next book. And so <laughs> like with the only one left, I did have to do a similar thing where it just, there were so many threads to keep track of mm -hmm. that. I eventually needed to just be like, okay, I'm I'm doing the index card on the floor thing and just rearranging and trying to figure it out. Because it is a very tricky balance. Mm -hmm. There's a lot going on in this book. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of it is beneath the surface. Like, Lenora is this very silent and still being. And you know what they say about still waters? They right. run deep. And there's a lot going on in Lenora's head. Right. And just there's a lot going on in the house in general. Like everyone there has some kind of secret. Mm -hmm. Everyone there has some kind of ulterior motive. And Kit has to kind of sift through it all and talk to them all. And I don't know if I trust him. I don't know if I believe him. I trust him now. And then later she does it and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And it was very difficult as a writer to just keep it all on track and keep it moving and keep it in a way that the reader won't get utterly lost. Sure. This is, I don't know if it's cliche or not, but sometimes a lot of writers will say, Oh, the, the character revealed something to me. Uh, I didn't even know they were going to say that. And then suddenly they did. I wonder if that was the case where you almost couldn't get into like the characters were surprising you specifically Lenora, specifically kit. Can you talk about, uh, how they may or may not have not only have they surprised me as I read it, but surprised you as you wrote it, because Kit has a whole other thing going on when she's not at that big house back with Kit's her. Got a, yeah, Kit's got a whole other a whole other bit of baggage going on. Um, Lenora has so much going on. Right. Um, for me, the the I think it was when I started out, I knew Lenora was going to be very limited in what she can do mm -hmm. but that begs the question then how am i going to make this character compelling like i thought at first just the mystery surrounding her would be enough and it's not enough like she couldn't just be a blank slate she needed to be deeper and express herself somehow and that's when i latched on to the idea of oh mm -hmm. i think she should be able to type yeah. And then through her typewritten pages, you get to see her personality come out and you get to see all these different facets of Lenora. And that was a thing that when I was writing these typewritten chapters that she's writing, yeah, where I'm like, oh, she's surprising me. She's much more humorous than I was expecting. Mm -hmm. And she's much more sad in some ways than I expected. And so. I wouldn't say necessarily it was like the character revealing herself to me, but it was along the way discovering new ways to make her very fascinating. You know what else is key in Gothic is uh, mood, atmosphere, and I don't know how you do that. That's the real magic. It's one thing for plot structure and character development, but just tone is so crucial, and that's another thing you you 
nailed. I almost wonder if I could just clumsily ask like, hmm, is this eerie enough? As I'm rewriting, maybe you're going through rewrite rewrites. Oh, just a little more eerie here, a little more tone there. I don't know how you do that. It's a little magic trick of writers, but um, it's something that I don't know how you get on the page, but you do. And if there's, I a- wish I knew. <laughs> like I, if, if I but don't is it in your head? Know. Is that something that you you contemplate about? Like, oh, hmm, tone, mood, atmosphere. Because if it were a movie, you'd have the benefit of maybe a Hans Zimmer like soundtrack surge. But no, you got to do it all on yourself. <laughs> well, I I think it helps that I do sometimes like picture it as a movie and i do listen to a lot of film scores Mm -hmm. as i'm writing because like you hear the sweeping music and you hear like the the screeching violins like from psycho or something and (laughs) it just puts me in a mood and i think some of that might just seep into the writing as i'm doing it where it's like okay i'm listening to this very cool creepy film score and it's just going from my ears to my brain to my fingertips onto the page like Mm -hmm some weird alchemy is at work. (laughs) Uh, And then of course, like I have a great editor who will say, you know, like, Oh, I think we need to, to spooky this up a little bit, like this scene here, or we need to tone it down a tad bit here. And so it, you, you know, in the editing process, we, we strike a better balance. And did you, and this is again, it's a, it's a twisty mystery. So everyone wants to know how it's going to end. Was this a case in which you knew early on how it would end? I knew most of the twist, like the big ones I knew because I knew I had to build to them and lead up to them. Sure. And then after that, new opportunities presented themselves Mm -hmm. where it, things that I wasn't originally planning came to me in the writing process from like oh i think i i think i need to do this because it's all there already i just didn't piece it together enough and and so that's why this book is just you know one of my favorite authors is megan abbott and she read this book early and she provided a blurb and i was so grateful and she called it a symphony of twists yeah and i think that's a perfect way to describe it But again, I think there's other blurbs on here that do mention that you are doing the work here of actually paying respect to the sense of grief or the the nobility of caregiving. So again, that balancing act, you really pulled it off. So thank you. We get to have some fun, but there's like some real actual sincere empathy in here. So, well, Riley Sager, thanks so much for joining us on this podcast to talk about this latest book. Congrats again. Thank you very much. Take care. Talk to you next year, I'm sure. Yes, come back. (laughs) And that was our chat with Riley Sager, New York Times bestselling author of Survive the Night and now The Only One Left and many other novels, many of which we circulate here in the Ferndale Library, if I'm not mistaken. In fact, possibly every single one of them. Thank you for listening to our chat with this uh, author, Riley Sager. Tune in next week for more, of course, but we don't want to leave without saying thanks to the friends of the Ferndale Library and to John Duffy for providing us music to open and close each episode. If you want to support this podcast, go to ferndalefriends.org. Remember to rate, review, subscribe, and leave a positive review. It could help us find more listeners. We'll be back next week with more. <laughs> <laughs>